Hello everyone and welcome to the United Soybean Board Data Literacy E-Meeting. I'm your host Trey Colley and I'm glad to have the opportunity to be with you for the next hour as we discuss agricultural data literacy. Currently, I am a research associate at The Ohio State University with a diverse background in digital ag technologies and data usage. We have a great program lined up for you today as we discuss the six core pillars of agricultural data. During our e-meeting, I'd like to ask for your participation by interacting with our topic ex experts via the Slido platform, which I'll show you here in a few minutes. I hope you are all ready for an exciting hour of learning and some of the most knowledgeable individuals in the digital ag space who will be presenting today. Today's presentations and subsequent question sessions will focus on the six pillars of data literacy that you see here. Data fundamentals, sources, management, the legal aspects of data, integrity, and not but and last but not least, how to utilize that data on your farm. Without a strong foundational understanding of each of these pillars, data literacy will be unachievable. Each pillar will be discussed in a concise five minute presentation by an ag data expert. So in order to provide you with a wealth of knowledge on each of these previously mentioned pillars, this project has a wide range of key university partners and project members that you see here. We would also like to acknowledge specifically the United Soybean Board for their support on this project. A large group of experts from the institutions shown are responsible for the creation of this content and one representative from each university will be presenting today. But multiple individuals from each university also contribute to the material that you'll see on the screen. Between each portion of this webinar, our expert presenters from each university will be answering submitted questions from Slido and asking you to answer a few questions as well. To participate in the e-meeting, please take out your mobile phone or tablet and open another window in your mobile internet browser. Enter slido.com into your browser and enter the event code hashtag USB2018. This will allow you to participate in the meeting and answer questions. As the presenters go through their uh, segments, feel free to submit your own questions, which will be answered at the end of each segment and in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, let's get started with our e-meeting. We'll have the five minute presentations on each of the data pillars. You'll notice that each pillar will be represented by an associated icon. We'll start with a data fundamentals presentation from Dr. John Fulton, an associate professor at the Ohio State University focusing on digital agriculture and precision ag technologies. Let's hear what he has to say. Hi, I'm John Fulton with the Ohio State University and we're gonna talk about data fundamentals. Growers with an understanding of farm data fundamentals can potentially improve efficiencies on the farm, enhance input allocation and use of those inputs, improve practices that are implemented, and ultimately they're able to inform decisions and bring new insights. Why is data important? It creates information to support these decisions. You can generate maps and conduct field or subfield level analyses. You can also pull data today for comparative learning. We call this benchmarking, where you compare yourself with others and see how you're doing, whether you're above average, below average, or such, but just new learning where you can go out and compare to others. But also today with the internet connectivity and cloud technologies being offered, provides access to these digital tools and new analytical pieces that the, the ag industry is starting to offer uh, growers. Just to start, data fundamentals. The process here is we want to collect and using the technologies that uh, have been adopted. We want to store. Ultimately, we want to analyze that data to create information, solutions, and recommendations, ultimately to provide decisions to the grower. One thing we, we uh, highly recommend is to understand how you're going to store data, 
whether that's going to be on farm, off farm, or a combination. But we also encourage growers to be able to back up data on an annual basis. Secondly, we recommend that growers organize that data. Until it's organized, it's very hard to utilize it, especially if we're going to access that down the road. When we think about data types, there's a variety of data that, that's generated on the farm. In this case, we're thinking kind of field level type data, but here's a, an example of how we organize some different data that's being generated today. That's agronomic data, machine data, prescriptions, remote sense data, and ultimately production data, all being important data streams that could be, bring information back to the grower. The important thing that we want to recommend here is identify what the data is being generated on the farm, but we should be also thinking about what technologies are creating that data today. We continue to do have some hurdles in the industry, compatibility being one of the primary ones, primarily, primary hurdles, interoperability and portability being two of those. Interoperability very basically is thinking about trying to connect brand A tractor to brand B planner, and, but ultimately portability is the, the utilization of data. How can I move, copy, or transfer that data very easily between environments or platforms without affecting the usability of it? One thing to do understand at the base fundamentals is formats of data. There's a wide range of formats being used today in the ag industry. These form formats can be both open in nature, but also proprietary. Okay, and on the right side here, just some list of common formats being utilized. The top three being open examples, with the bottom data uh, formats being examples pr very proprietary that uh, are generated by a company. In that case, I'm gonna need a software package in order to uh, upload that data and ultimately view or utilize it in some fashion. An example of this would be just, here's an as-applied map in the center. Uh, very common today to be collected on machinery. Uh, this one's for fertilizer, but we think about that being collected on the right left side by the NCAB display. I have to download and ultimately upload that into a farm management software to generate the information in the map that you see in the middle. At the core of that data is this data was generated by a Raven Viper 2. The file format when we pulled that data off of that Viper was a .rbin, that's a proprietary one that again ultimately needed to be uploaded into the farm management software package to be viewed and used. Please do understand there's a lot of file formats. So if we zoom in, you see a zoom in there, we see a lot of data that's geo-referenced and that, in, that it represents how much was applied where. But inside that, that, that file are elements, date, locations, applied rate, elevation, ground speed, and much more information could be. So just please understand that there's a lot of file formats within these proprietary files or even open files. So the key takeaways today is data can be used to make informed decisions. One of the first steps that we, we suggest taking is identify those technologies being used and the data being generated by those technologies. We encourage growers to develop some kind of procedure to download that data and ultimately archive it. There's a variety, I understand there's a variety of formats that you're gonna to have to manage. There are still hurdles in the industry and the primary one being compatibility. But ultimately, in order to take a full advantage of data today, we need to be able to store it. It should be organized and that helps with both the utilization but also sharing. And for those that are gonna be sharing data, which we see that growing in the future, you gotta determine to share it, a strategy. How am I gonna share these data files with others in order to capture new insights and learnings? So with that, we wanted to ask you, the audience, a question today. And the question is, is do you actively collect data on your farm? Yes or no? Great, thanks for those insights from Dr. Fulton. Everyone take a moment to answer his question on Slido. If you jumped on late, you can see the right side of your screen there for instructions. You're going to open your mobile browser, enter slido.com, and then hashtag USB2018 to access the question and answers uh, section of our interactive e-meeting. So we'll give everybody a few minutes there to answer that question of do you actively collect data on your farm today?
Right now we have about 10 responses and 80% of you say you do collect data on your farm today. And thank you for your participation as an audience. We think this is a great way to interact with you and, and get some feedback as well. So our next data pillar will be data sources. And today we're going to hear from Dr. Ignacio Campetti. He's a uh, professor at Kansas State University focusing on agronomic systems. And he has some great insights on the types of data sources you can utilize to make your farm more efficient. So let's listen in to his presentation. My name is Dr. Ignacio Campetti. I'm a cropping system specialist at Kansas State University. And together with faculty from this university, Dr. AJ Sharda, uh, we start discussing the data sources. This section will provide an overview from data types, information collected from different sources, and will provide some, I mean, strong understanding on what are the different type of on-farm data. Just to identify data sources, there are some ones that will be freely available, farmers will have access to, and there is some another type of data that the farmers are the ones generating that, like a yield monitor information or any information that is by ground sensors. Knowing the different type of data that is available is critical for taking decisions. Moving forward and utilize, utilizing that different type of on-farm data layers and looking at pres prescriptions, I mean, for input decisions or management is critical for advancing in precision ag. So if we move to what is the agricultural sources, I mean, and we call this section Ag Source 101. What are the main data sources? So our team divide this information into agronomic and machinery types. The agronomic divided into soils, crops, weather, and remote sensing, and the machinery is specifically everything related to operation and a supply in. So when farmers decide, I would like to use information to take decisions, they will be facing this situation. They will be facing situation that where on farm data came from different type of sources. From our soils, as an example, we can have information on soil type from Surgo, publicly available, or grid sampling on farm generated by collecting samples from the soils. From the crop side, anything connected to farmers going out to the field, scouting for pests, integrated pest management to decide and take a decision on the application, or information collected on plant traits like stand counts or taking yield estimations. And the last one is also to emphasize when farmers want to understand the nutritional status on, on a plant to decide to do plant tissue analysis. On the weather side, farmers have access more readily to any information collected from local weather stations, real-time information on precipitation and temperature, or any information on meteorological stations, I mean, collecting real-time data on frost and water deficit. Remote sensing is a little more complex and challenging. We have four different sources. I mean, just to provide examples on satellite and all the different type of sensors, airplanes, ground sensors like Green Seeker, Lycor, SPAD, and drones with different type of sensors. I mean, cameras, multispectral, or just simple RGB cameras. Last two ones, when we enter to the machinery side, the operation side, anything related to performance of the machine, fuel consumption, or speed sensor data. And the last one related to applications, seeing rate, prescription, yield monitoring information, anything connected to soil mapping, electrical activity, and or, I mean, different equipment like a sprayer and looking at flow rate, pressure, and prescription. So let me give you an example of a case study. Farmers today are, first, are facing multiple types of different data sources from soils, weather, remote sensing, plants, machinery. Farmers, when they are taking a decision, they are selecting some of the layers. In this case, I'm showing a few examples on soil type, grid sampling, satellite, ground speed, and yield monitor. 
those layers are considered, I mean, to increase, uh, I mean, the knowledge on the variability of the field with the goal of creating what we call the management zones in this example. Areas of the field that the farmers will be able to manage in a more uniformly approach. So let's go to uh, specifically one by one examples of different type of data. Here I'm showing the soil data. Here is an example of one field looking at surgo data, showing all the different soil types and organic matter and different soil parameters. Example on remote sensing data, satellite from different type of sensors, timing of the year, and resolutions. We go from very coarse resolution, uh, large pixel size on Landsat, and then all the way to the rapid eye, which is a high resolution satellite. When you look at also knowing about features of the field, LIDAR is ex an example of understanding situations like altitude positions, slope, or even how the water flows in the field. Here is another example of the complexity of all the different type of data layers. Lastly, is the machinery or ground sensors data. In this case, is, this section is also very rich. It can go from machinery equipment, like electrical activity, uh, planting data or yield monitor, and also can be collected with ground sensors, like in this situation, using just a handheld ground sensor to identify and create a water content map. Main goal, once we start looking at all the different layers, is to create this situation, as we call the potential different management zones. These are areas of the field that the farmer will manage more uniformly. Here in the example, we are showing green sections of the field, potentially high yielding areas, red sections, low yielding areas. So key takeaways from this presentation, there are multiple types of sources, timing and applications, I mean, it matters when we are selecting sources. The availability of data is complex. Some of the data is publicly available, but processing and access to the data is not that easy. Challenges for farmers is how to identify and access to that data. And our last point is how to utilize the data. Knowing when, where, how, and what are the really next steps on how really to use all the different sources to take actions. So now, I would like to pose a question and get some feedback from our viewers. What type of remote sensing data do you usually use? Great, so thanks for that, Ignacio. Everyone take a moment to answer his Slido question on your mobile device. It looks like most of you use a combination of data sources when you refer to remote sensing data. Just as a reminder, you can submit your own questions. If you look in your browser on the left-hand side, there's a tab that, titled Questions, and you can type in your own question, and we'll answer those as we uh, come across them in the webinar. So it looks like we've got 11 responses so far. Drones is the second place response and uh, but it looks like most of you are using a combination of those data sources so that was a great presentation by ignacio and when we think about the data coming in from those sources we know that as a grower in 2018 we we're going to have to manage that data uh, analyze it and ultimately make a decision or a, a management um, step moving forward so in order to better understand that, we brought in Dan Baker from Iowa State University to discuss data management and what that looks like in the modern farm. So I'm going to talk about data management as it uh, relates to precision ag. First, I'd like to define data management, and that's farming information that is captured, organized, and archived and this is critical field data for what we consider modern farm and planning, decision making, and cropping system strategies during a growing season and in across growing seasons. And um, also, when it comes to data, um, so the successful and profitable farming businesses not only consider land, buildings, equipment, and livestock 
as well as crops as assets, but also farm data. So I'm gonna describe data management using this, um, using this uh, graphic. It's uh, pretty common across um, disciplines, but it's, it's a way to uh, visualize your, your data management and how you go about doing it. So data is nothing more than farm records, which farm, farm operations have, have managed for many years. And management is simply the act of record keeping. And the example to the right shows just a, a graphic of the monitor and it's going to ask you what record keeping um, you'd like to do. Data mobility is important on the farm. The arrows um, indicate how data moves across the farm and that can be done using USB cards or, or USB or SD cards. Other methods are telematics and Bluetooth um, methods of wireless transfer, as you see in some of these examples. Data organization is also important. First of all, you should know your display and know it very well so you can um, use it efficiently. Um, you should take time to organize each field operation so every time you pull into a field, your monitor may ask you how do you want uh, to organize your data, which is important later on. And then also when you organize, um, part of that is how you back that up. And uh, um, you know, we always want a backup of our data as we collect it. Next, uh, data tools. Some data tools, it's an important part of the data collection piece. And these are factory or third party sensors that can um, be used um, in the data collection. And on the left, your monitor may ask you how you want those sensors um, set up um, on your toolbar or your planter or what have you. Also, we have um, mobile devices and apps, and these are important in several um, of our data management aspects in the collection, in how we make farm planning and decision making, and then how we archive that data. And here are some examples of, of how we do that on the left. There's weather apps and apps to calibrate a sprayer, for example. And on the right, we have how we archive data, which can be through a box site or Google Drive. And then um, other tools we have are prediction algorithms. And these help us in our decision making and farm planning um, piece of data management. And these help us um, make decisions and um, in our planning uh, for future operations. Finally, I'm gonna talk about farm management information systems. And this is basically your software platform you use. And these systems touch almost every aspect of data management. So if you have a desktop software platform, some pros and cons for using these platforms are, um, you customize your reports or have greater uh, analytical capabilities. You can archive data easier or in a manner which um, suits you, and then you have some good privacy controls. Some cons are there's um, periodic updates to that platform, and mobility is reduced if you want to use it across different um, computers, and then um, there's a, um, training that needs to be done on a, on a continual basis. Cloud server platforms are a little different. They're easier to use, um, they're more mobile, there's more data sharing, and there's an offering of tools that come out um, quite often. Um, some of the cons for those, it's continually changing, so you need to keep up with those changes. You may have hardware compatibility issues with your, um, your farm systems in the, in the cab or in your office. And then data archiving is, um, can be an issue as well. So some key takeaways we have are you need to take time to manage your farm data just like it's any other asset on your farm. Uh, data mobility is how farm moves, uh, data moves across the farm. And if it cannot move, then we can't utilize it in our data management tree. When data is not well organized, then it's difficult to use effectively. So that's an important aspect as well. And then I would say that data tools, such as apps, and your software platform affects nearly all aspects of your data management. So those may be your keys into doing better data management on the farm. 
So I'll, I will pose a question to the audience, um, and that would be, would you manage your own data or utilize a trusted advisor? And you can answer that through the Slido app. Great, thanks, Dan. That's a really important question that people need to be thinking about, who is ultimately managing your data? So take a moment and answer that on the Slido app. Looks like 73% of you that have voted so far are managing your own data. But a few of you are also sharing or having a trusted advisor uh, conduct that service for you. It's a pretty interesting and important piece of the digital ag part of the farm. Being able to manage that data and to do it efficiently enables you to make better, more informed decisions. So when we think about the collection and utilization of this data on the farm and, and ultimately with third party providers, there's a certain legal aspect to that that we're going to discuss next with Dr. Bruce Erickson from Purdue University. Uh, Bruce has worked on this topic for a few years and is uh, one of the leading experts in the world on the legal aspects of ag data. So let's hear what he has to say in this next five minute presentation. Thanks for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Bruce Erickson, I'm with Purdue University, and I'm here to talk about the legal aspects of farm data. First of all, in terms of defining data, ownership is a little bit different with data, as you probably would suspect, as compared to a more tangible asset, such as a building, land, equipment, or even a farm animal. And so this presents a legal challenge and something that we have to deal with. And of course, we know in the law that you can protect something that, uh, and show ownership of something that you've created originally, such as a patent or a copyright can protect that. We also know that things that people do uniquely, such as if they have a certain pattern of work or they invent a formula or a recipe or something like that, that can be treated as ownership of a trade secret. And so none of these apply perfectly to farm data ownership, but uh, probably the closest one would be a trade secret because a farmer who collects data from their farm to understand a field's unique characteristics could claim it as a trade secret. So I'm gonna go through three examples of three different situations where the ownership of data could be questionable and what a farmer might want to do about that. First of all, a farmer on land that is rented would probably consider that the data generated on that land is theirs, but also the landowner can consider that uh, they own that data as well. And so here's an opportunity to perhaps clarify that. And by doing that, what you might think about would be some kind of an agreement where you define the types of data. Is it yield data? Is it soil test data? Whatever. Um, to establish who is the owner, and then to specify the outcome if the lease is terminated or expires or something like that. Uh, because we do know that data long term uh, potentially has great value from a piece of land and so it's worth thinking about this. Another aspect would be if you have a service provider such as a co-op come in and spread fertilizer, spray, this kind of stuff. Again, the service provider could think that they are the owner of the data since they're providing the equipment and they have the unique characteristic that they're doing. But again, the farmer might think that, that they're the owner because they're hiring this other organization to come into their farm or work for hire. So again, any agreement should specify what type of data, how the data will be, be made accessible from the service provider to the farmer, anything regarding calibration because it needs the data needs to be good quality in order for this to work, and uh, some other aspects, um, you know, such as retention and privacy uh, considerations need to be part of that too. Thirdly, what about ag tech service providers? Farmers are sending their data off to companies to um, uh, analyze that data, and often the thing that makes this different relationship different typically than from a service provider or uh, a landowner is that typically the ag tech provider has the agreement existing. It's up to the farmer to take a look at that and see if that's acceptable to them or not. So Farm Bureau has done some work on this and they have uh, some principles in place on their website. Uh, you can see fb.org, you can go to that. Some things to think about would be what happens if the company that you're sending your data to is sold? Uh, can you move it to another company? Can you get your data back? What happens if there's a data breach? Uh, those types of things. Uh, as a final thing, I just want everyone to know that uh, there are 
laws in place that, um, such as the Freedom of Information Act uh, from the federal government and state and local laws that sometimes apply where your data could be subject to uh, disclosure. And uh, typically this is if you are working with the government or receiving government money, those types of things. Uh, of course, uh, personal information, trade secrets, financial information are not a part of that, but just be aware in these particular situations. So overall, the key takeaways would be um, that data is not well defined, like something tangible, like an animal or land or something like that. Uh, think about the opportunity in farm leases and service agreements and with ag tech providers. Some things to consider would be the portability and what happens when companies change and those types of things. And just be aware of the Freedom of Information Act and state and local laws that may impact your data too. One final thing, I'd just like to thank the contributions of Todd Jansen and Jansen Ag Law who had provided considerable help uh, with this presentation. So now what I'd like to do would be to ask you as a participant a question. And the question is, do you have a data agreement with any of your landowners? Great, thanks for that information, Bruce. That's one thing that probably a lot of growers throughout the US aren't thinking of right now, is do you have a data agreement with your landowner? Take a moment to answer that question. It looks like currently with eight responses, about 75% of you do not have a data agreement with your landowner. That may be something that we need to think about moving forward as data is generated on the farm. So with the, the collection and analysis of data and when we're making decisions based on data, we want to be sure that data that we're using has, is from a calibrated machine or is accurately represents the information that's in the field. So the integrity of that data is one of the key components to making a quality agricultural decision. So let's hear from Laura Thompson, an on-farm research specialist from Nebraska Lincoln University. And we'll see what she has to say about data integrity and usage on the farm. Thank you. I'm Laura Thompson and I'll be covering the data pillar termed data integrity. So to get started, the purpose of this data pillar is growers need a strong understanding of farm data integrity or data quality. So more specifically, it's, un it's important to understand how errors during data collection and processing may affect the decision-making process. And it's important to understand the methods we have available for improving data quality. This will ultimately result in growers having more confidence in the data that they're collecting and the results of future analyses and it'll allow them to have more confidence in decisions that they're making based on the data that they're collecting on their farms. So why is data integrity or quality important? Well, first of all, there are errors that are inherent in nearly every sensor or system of sensors that are used in precision agriculture. These errors can propagate through future analysis and affect prescriptions and other analysis results. When we're looking at doing on-farm research, proper experimental design is critical to help minimize errors that, are, that can occur during an on-farm research trial. And to have maximum confidence in data-driven decisions, proper error correction and analyses are critical. So let's take a look at an example. Here we have yield monitor data. Yield monitors utilize a suite of sensors to estimate yield and errors can originate from sensors themselves or from the method of estimating area harvested. So on the top, you see a portion of the yield monitor map that is raw yield data points directly from the combine monitor. You can see that there are many data points that are red where there was a yield of zero bushels per acre recorded. This is where the monitor was still recording yield data, but the combine was not harvesting grain and occurred at the end of the rows. On the bottom image, you can see the same yield map, but with these erroneous data points removed. It's important to clean yield data before data is used further. So in this case, we used a program called USDA Yield Editor, which is a free software to clean the data. Often yield data is used to create a prescription layer, such as a nitrogen application prescription. 
So in this case, we've taken that data and developed a nitrogen prescription using a university nitrogen rate equation, which utilizes yield as one component in the equation. So as you can see, the errors in the yield data have propagated and affected the prescription that we've generated. In this case, on the top, you can see that wherever there were zero yield values, we have improperly lowered our nitrogen recommendation. There are areas in the field which are receiving 75 pounds less nitrogen than would be recommended when we're using the clean yield data. So this is just one example of the importance of yield data quality. Many growers also are utilizing on-farm research as a source of information for their farming operation. And this is a great way to get information that is specific to your farm and growing environment. However, to get the most out of your on-farm research efforts and have confidence in your results, it's important to follow proper experimental design guidelines. So in this example, the grower was interested in evaluating his planting population. You can see that we have three seeding treatments, 32,000, 36,000, and 40,000 seeds per acre. And each of these treatments has been arranged into blocks where each block contains each treatment. We've then replicated those blocks six times across the field, and we've randomized the order that the rates occur within each of the blocks. So this helps us to reduce and account for the effects of field variability. When evaluating the results of an on-farm research study, it's great to include some economical and statistical aspects to help understand the data. So in this case, we're evaluating that economic response for the seeding rates we just looked at. We can use statistical analysis to help us determine the confidence in the results. So in this case, if you look at the graph there on the right, looking at partial profit for each of those three seeding rates, uh, we can see that if we had just looked at the third replication and placed the trial there, we would have uh, concluded that the 36,000 seeding rate was most economical. However, since we had six replications, we can see from that chart and the, the table below that most of the time, four out of six replications, the rate of 32,000 seeds per acre was the most economical. So our takeaways here, data quality must be considered to ensure confidence in decisions made on the farm. Visualizing data sets or using automated tools can help us reduce those errors in the data we're collecting. When we're looking at doing on-farm research, using proper experimental uh, trial designs and planning is critical to get quality information. And then finally, using statistical analysis of randomized replicated data is key for making solid data-driven decisions on the farm. So now we'd like to turn to Slido and uh, pose a question here. Do you perform quality control and cleaning of your yield data prior to using it to make management decisions? Great, thanks, Laura. That's a really key piece of making a management decision is making sure you have data of high integrity uh, for your decision-making process. It looks like 60% of you are cleaning and performing some type of quality control on your data. You know, that can sometimes be done through a farm management software, as Dan talked about, or, um, or manually through some uh, Excel manipulation or some other type of, of way of performing quality control. So once we have that high quality data, we want to know what to do with it. And so Dr. Elizabeth Hawkins, an on-farm research specialist from Ohio State University, is going to talk about data utilization, using data to, to make an informed decision on my farm. So let's hear from Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Hawkins from The Ohio State University, and today I'm going to cover our final data pillar, data utilization. When we're thinking about data, I think that it's nice to think about data as a tool. If you use it correctly, data has the potential to provide insights to improve your farm management. And growers who use their data to improve decision making can help optimize their farm management, whether that be through reducing their risks, increasing their profits, or reducing their inputs. So data utilization by definition is the process of taking your data to create usable information or knowledge. So if you look at this flow chart, we take our data and we extract information from it, whether that be through visualization or analysis, and then use the knowledge that we gain from that in order to make a decision. 
So what sorts of decisions can you use to inform your decision making? Um, many growers are using data currently to help with their decision making. Uh, making decisions such as variety selection, creating seeding rate prescriptions, or variable rate fertilizer applications, just to name a few. So when we're using data to make a decision, I think it's important to have a strategy. So the first thing is to identify the problem that you're trying to solve and then target your data collection in order to make sure that you're addressing that question. So to walk through an example, let's say the problem that we're looking to, to solve is what is the optimum seeding rate for soybeans in a specific field. So if we take an on-farm research approach to answering this question, some of the data we need to have would be a plot layout with georeference locations, stand counts to make sure that our planter is executing that prescription, and then yield monitor data to assess the results. Some other data that might be helpful in interpreting this information could be as planted data or aerial imagery. So continuing with this example, here is a picture of the as planted data showing the target rate. As you can see, we had four replications of four different seeding rates, ranging from 116,000 seeds per acre to 185,000 seeds per acre. Here on the right are the yield results after that data has been cleaned. It's tough to tell from this visualization which seeding rate is the winner. So if we look at this table, we can see on the left are seeding rates, our target seeding rates. In the next column are the actual planted seeding rates based on the as planted data. And then here is the yield analysis. And what we see here is that the highest yield was achieved with the highest seeding rate. One thing to consider when using our data is that sometimes there's a little bit more to the story. So if we take into account the additional cost of the additional seed for the higher seeding rates, you can see that the decision that we may make could be different. In this case, the lowest seeding rate, 116,000 seeds per acre, is the treatment that achieved the highest profit. So it's important to make sure that when we're trying to make a decision, we're taking into account any and all data that can help assess the agronomic and economic impacts of that particular practice. So to summarize these data pillars, the first thing to remember is that data has the potential to improve farm management decisions. And you're only going to realize the value of your data if you're using it. And then collecting and using the right data can help you gain insight for improved decision making. So our question for you is what data are you currently using for decision making on your farm? Great, thanks for those insights, Elizabeth. I know with my research at Ohio State, we've used at some point, if not altogether, all of those data layers. It looks like you all are using a good many of them too. We have seven responses so far, and yield data is by far the, the most popular choice, but also aerial imagery and soil data are pretty high as well. It's great to see that utilization rate as we go into a more data-driven um, time during digital agriculture. So with some great insights from Elizabeth, that will wrap up our um, pr presentation portion of the e-meeting. And now we'd like to do an interactive Q&A session along with some polls that we'd like to push to you as an audience. So if you would all take out your mobile device and, and try to answer some of the questions you had during this meeting, as well as get some feedback from you through a few polls. So I'll address a couple of more administrative type questions that were asked during the meeting. And that's, will the slides be made available? And yes, the presentation is currently being recorded and will be posted. So stay tuned through some of our Ohio State media outlets, as well as other uh, additional outlets will be pushing this content out. There will also later be additional de details available on these topics too. So with that we're going to uh, transition to 
answer having some of these questions that you submitted answered by the um, data expert. So first of all, we'd like to start with um, with Bruce Erickson from Purdue University, and he had a question that about the uh, are there any resources available if I want to develop data contracts with my landowners and trusted advisors? Where can we start, Bruce, uh, from a legal aspect, starting to look at those data agreements? Uh, can you hear me okay, Trey? Yep, loud and clear. Yeah, so um, uh, that's a great question. I guess you've caught me without a very good answer to that. Uh, in terms of the farm leases and in terms of the uh, agreements with the um, service providers, I, I'm not aware of resources available, but I will check with uh, Todd Jansen on that and uh, we'll provide some information back. So uh, certainly on the service provider agreements, go to uh, Farm Bureau or FB.org and uh, they have a whole list of things to consider uh, as you're signing those uh, service provider agreements. Or, yep. Great, thanks Bruce. Okay, so uh, Laura Thompson, we have a question for you related to uh, automated data cleaning software. So Laura, could you give us some insights to how we can clean data and ultimately make sure that we have are making a decision based on uh, data that is high quality? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, so there's a variety of different options available. The one that I mentioned there in the webinar was using a free program that's put out by USDA and it's called Yield Editor and you can go online and download that for yourself. That allows you to read the, the files in and clean them based on a variety of different parameters and it kind of guides you through the cleaning process as well. So that's been a popular one to use. Uh, there's of course other options. You could do it uh, kind of more of a manual approach in your farm management software. So for example, if you're using something like Ag Leader SMS, you could go in and put some filters on to filter out data that's you know, below a yield level that's reasonable or above a yield level that's reasonable, um, as well as filtering on other things such as um, if the header's up or down or the speed of the harvester or things like that that, you know, filter to get to a reasonable range of operation um, for those parameters as well. So that would be another option. And then I think Trey kind of mentioned you could even do something like uh, some filtering in Excel even. So just kind of doing a similar approach, filtering out uh, extreme variable or extreme uh, values for different variables. Great. Thanks, Laura. It sounds like there are some good opportunities. Uh, to be able to evaluate and clean data. So next we're gonna ask you to respond to our poll that we just made live, and that was what on-farm technologies are you using for soybean production? So we'll take a moment to answer that. I think with, currently with Ohio State, we're using uh, numerous categories and, and specific technologies during our soybean research, whether that be auto guidance or uh, a yield monitor or aerial imagery. We're seeing that the more technologies we use, uh, the better we can make a decision related to soybean production. So it looks like you all are using section control, variable rate technologies, uh, some, some applied data cases. That's great to see as far from a data perspective. And when we use that data, you know, we got to think about how are we managing it, going back to Dan's presentation. Okay, well, thanks for those responses. We're, uh, we're going to push the next poll now. And that's it. Are you currently conducting some type of on-farm research? And we've seen a big adoption of that across Ohio with our new eFields program. And we're really seeing that that's being very, bene very beneficial to those growers, whether that's determining a soybean seeding rate or determining nitrogen rates in corn, having that applied data relative to your farm has been very valuable.
Okay, so thanks for your responses there. And now we're going to take it back to Bruce one more time to discuss one more legal question. And so Bruce, how many legal cases related to ag data have there been so far? Are you aware of any of those um, from a just broad industry-wide view that have had some type of impact on this ag data space and specifically related to the legal aspects? Yeah, so Trey, um, in my conversations with Todd, um, there, there's very little legal precedence in terms of what to do with ag data. That's part of the reason for my comments and, and that we're kind of, um, you know, uh, wandering in the dark in terms of this. There, there's really, um, you know, no, no precedent in terms of this. So we have to look to other parts of the law, you know, to hopefully provide some guidance as to what to do, you know, like in terms of the uh, trademarks and, and, um, and the intellectual property and trade secrets and that type of thing. So, um, yeah, again, I'll check with Todd for sure, but, but there's very little precedence of that. A lot of the stuff is fairly new in the farm environment. Yeah, that's what we've seen as well. And, you know, as we move forward and have more data collected in the near future and as digital ag technologies become more integrated into the farm, you know, you certainly expect that some of those cases may come up. Yeah, and I guess I might add, uh, Trey, if I've still got the platform or the floor here for a little bit. Um, one, one of the key things in terms of any agreement, whether it's um, a farmer working with a landowner, whether it's a farmer working with a uh, service provider, or even possibly with an ag tech provider, a, a company, um, you know, and less so with the third example there, but if you're working with a farmer or a service, uh, uh, a farm owner or a service provider, key is communication. Um, the, uh, anytime you're in any kind of a business relationship is to communicate the expectations, get it down on paper, and to have some kind of an understanding. Uh, a lawyer can finalize all this, but before you meet with a lawyer, uh, make sure that you have a clear direction as to what uh, you think is, your, is stuff that you own and what you feel is stuff that the other party owns and uh, how you're going to manage that if there is a breakup of some kind, uh, a change in plans, and all that type of thing. Great, thanks Bruce. Some good insights there on, on getting started during the legal aspects of data. So after we've talked about that, we're gonna to go to Dan Barker now from Iowa State University. And Dan, we're looking to see, do you have any recommendations on storing ag data in the cloud? And if so, how are you utilizing that at Iowa State to, to make a management decision? Well, if uh, I think I think cloud management of data takes a relatively modest level of computer literacy and understanding. So, so I think if if a grower or um, a, uh, a farmer, I think they may want to use a, an advisor for that at least initially, um, or get some training on on how to do cloud manage their cloud management. If they have some prior experience in that, that would also help. Um, and then, uh, and then connectivity is also an issue. So, where you're located, um, what your internet connectivity is on your farm, um, that is also that can also be an option um, for either having you know whether you have good internet connectivity or not. So that's something to consider, and that's kind of a topic in rural America. Uh, is um, for precision farming is having um, um, more internet connectivity out in rural areas. How we use it at Iowa State, um, since you know we are campus-based or we have our research farm just three, mi three miles outside of Ames, is uh, is we utilize m uh, more of that, more and more of that, so we don't have to um, rely on. Um, SD cards or data passing from one hand to another manually. So we use that quite a bit in our the, the our research group at Iowa State. Great, thanks, Dan. We're definitely using a, a suite of cloud-based tools at Ohio State as well to manage our ag data. So now that we've heard from Dan, we'd like to pose a, another poll to the audience, and that's what type of value do precision ag technologies bring? 
specifically to soybean production. So if you don't mind, take a few seconds and type in an answer there about the types of technologies you're using on your farm today. One of the things that at Ohio State that we've been really utilizing during this growing season is the use of scouting apps to understand where certain areas of the field may be deficient or why they are deficient and what types of remediation can we use, if not this year and in, in following years, to truly understand the, the variability in those fields. So it looks like you all are using some guidance, uh, technologies, anything to reduce inputs. I see a response on disease management. That's a big one, especially uh, as crazy weather we've had this year, it get hot and cold and wet and dry. Uh, you know, really, as we go through the season, the ability to manage uh, in-season um, cropping inputs, that's an area that we've seen prevalent uh, in recent years. So, well, great, thanks for your responses there. Now we're gonna push another poll to you about, uh, another one about on-farm research, specifically related to how you're conducting that on-farm research. So we're interested in knowing do you utilize randomization and replication when you're setting up your on-farm research project or are you just running one strip trial? We'd like to know that as far as the level of statistical use on your farm. And it looks like so far with seven responses that 70% of you are using some type of randomization replication. So Laura, can you just touch a, a few sentences about why that randomization and replication is important on your farm and, and kind of what you've seen? I know you hit on it in your presentation, but if you can just give a, a note towards that on why that's important. Sure, yeah, that's great to hear that a lot of people are using that. Um, so one of the things that quickly comes to mind is just the amount of field variability that we have. And I think a lot of people inherently kind of know that, that they've got a lot of variability. Um, but if you just set up your field, even if you use a lot of replications, maybe comparing with and without some treatment, and repeat that over and over across your field, uh, but maybe you have something like a soil texture gradient, um, you might end up favoring one treatment as you move across the field um, unconsciously. And there's of course other sources of variability as well, uh, but the ability to conduct some statistical analysis and having things set up with that replication and randomization really just gives us a lot more confidence in the research results, um, especially when we're talking about then taking those results and applying those to you know, a lot of acres across an operation. So it's great to um, really have confidence before using your data that way. Oh, that's great. Oh, thank you for that. And so now that Laura touched on that, Elizabeth Hawkins is also the Ohio State on-farm research specialist. Elizabeth, do you have any uh, additional comments to data integrity and then also what are some ways in your area of Ohio that you've seen on-farm research really, really provide an impact at the farm management level? Yeah, um, I'd just like to really reiterate what Laura said about um, replication and randomization being very important to managing that field variation. And then here in my part of Ohio, field variation plays a key role because we have a lot of fields um, that are very small and often have, you know, three or more different soil types within that field. So being able to not only manage that variation in trials, but then start understanding that variation and the role that can play in improving our management, say through approaches like variable rate fertilizer or even variable rate seeding has been very informative. Well, that's great. It sounds like even, you know, within soybeans production itself, you're able to use that data to, to make a decision or adjustments on your current practices. I'm 
Okay. Well, we'd like to take one more poll response for you, and that's uh, what type of data do you usually use more frequently in your operation? This one's kind of a, from a broader perspective when you look at uh, some of the data sources that Ignacio and, and the great people from Kansas State laid out earlier in the e-meeting. And so are you typically using uh, soil data, crops data, maybe that's machinery data from in on uh, in-season applications or as-planted data. It looks like most of you are using crops or remote sensing data to inform decisions. And we saw that that's data sources can come from so many different aspects and uh, the streams of data that are available on the farm today are, are really only increasing in number. So that can be something that's kind of hard to sift through and understand what, what the best data source is for a particular problem. It looks like crops data is one of the, the types that you're typically using to inform your on-farm decisions. I think that's great. And uh, as we move forward into the digital ag space, you know, it's really important to understand these data fundamentals and become literate in on-farm data usage. And we hope that today through this e-meeting you are able to, to truly grasp a, a concept of how data can be used on the farm to inform your management decisions. And we would just like to, to thank you for joining us today. And we, if you would take just a few minutes, we're gonna send out a survey to you all to understand if our content correctly conveyed the, the six pillars of data literacy. So if you'll take a few seconds just to complete these questions and give us some feedback on how we can develop our content to make the ultimate impact on, the, on growers throughout the United States and globally when it comes to ag data. So if you'll take a few minutes just to answer that, thank you so much for being patient during our technical difficulties at the beginning of the e-meeting and, and we hope that you were able to take home a few key points at least for um, when you're thinking about data literacy on the farm and what that looks like from the farm uh, as a whole and for you specifically as a farm uh, decision maker. So thank you for joining us today. Please take some time and answer those questions for us and we look forward to speaking with you again.